a good Nerev Shabbos. You know what they say, a kiss is just a kiss. But for a book of the Bible, we got a lot of kisses. In the book of Genesis, Chumash Bereshis. The first one was way back in Parshas Toldos with Yitzchak asking for a fatherly kiss from Esav, who was actually Yaakov, dressed up in Esav's clothing. In the next Parsha, Yaakov offered Rivka a kiss as a sign of affection and intention. And then we have Esav himself kissing his brother Yaakov on their reunion after many years. Yosef kissing all his brothers upon revealing his identity as one of their own, to name just a few. There was a very significant kiss as we began the book of Shemais, the book of Exodus last week, which you may or may not have noticed, right at the end of the sixth Aliyah. Moshe and Aaron meet as adults, they're around 80, when God instructs Aaron to go meet his brother Moshe on the mountain of God in the desert. The Midrash notes this meeting between the brothers and underscores that they kiss and it explains the importance of the kiss from a verse in Tehillim, Psalm 85, where it says, Chesed ve'emes nifgashu, tzedek v'shalom nashaku. Kindness and truth met, righteousness and peace kissed. They say this is the deeper meaning behind Moshe and Aaron meeting and kissing. This medrash is one basis for our framing, our classic uh, framing of Aaron as the paragon of kindness, chesed, peace, and our view of Moshe as the exemplar of righteousness, justice, truth. If you're wondering, hey, why are these two opposite realms? Can't they all be one? You're asking a good question, maybe better than any answer we can give. First of all, the kiss shows that the two meet, if not overlap. Second of all, no one has it all. Hashem has it all, but none of us has every quality precisely in the right dosage or proportion or measure. Sometimes we all tilt a little more towards compromise, other times a little more towards the letter of the law rather than the spirit of the law. How could we be any different? Maybe these are not opposites, but points on a spectrum. Now in our portion of Era this week, we see that sometimes Moshe is mentioned before Aaron, and sometimes it's the other way around, Aaron before Moshe. Moshe is, of course, the greatest of prophets, but then again, Aaron was his older brother. Shouldn't he be mentioned first? Out of respect, just ask any older brother. The end of the second Aliyah today read, Hu Aharon u Moshe, Asher Amar Hashem Lahem. These are Aaron and Moshe, to whom God said, Hoitziu es b'nei Yisrael me'eretz Mitzrayim al tzivaysam. Bring out the children of Israel from the land of Egypt according to their legions. And the following verse says, Heim hamadab me'opare, me'alach Mitzrayim. These are the ones who spoke to Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. L'hoitzi es b'nei Yisrael Mitzrayim, to bring the Jews out of Egypt. Hu Moshe ve'aharon. These are Moshe and Aaron. So in one verse, Aaron is mentioned first, and soon after, the very next verse, Moshe is mentioned first. Maybe there's a kind of fairness here. Everyone gets a chance to go first, which is certainly nice. And maybe it's also teaching us something about balance. We're not the first ones to notice this. It also caught Rashi's attention and in his, in his classic commentary on the Torah he writes there are places where it mentions Aaron before Moshe and there are places where it mentions Moshe before Aaron to demonstrate that they are equal. Wait, we said before that Moshe is the greatest of all of our prophets, so equal? Let's take a closer look. First of all, we don't mean to say that Moshe was only Emes and Tzedek, just justice and truth, and Aaron was only love and peace. No doubt they shared all these qualities, and we're emphasizing one outstanding Mida, one outstanding character aspect of each. This is the Parsha where God tells the two brothers to approach Paro, the king of Egypt, and demand that he release the enslaved nation, B'nai Yisrael. Moshe responds to God saying, it'll never work. He says, the Jews themselves won't listen to me. How could it be that Pharaoh will listen to me? God doesn't actually address Moshe's protest directly. Rather, he tells the two of them to address the Jewish people and Pharaoh, both, that it's time for the Jews to leave Egypt. And God continues in explaining that the liberation, in fact, the continuation and endurance and persistence of the Jewish people then through history and now does not conform to logic 
or the laws of nature and the natural rise and fall of nations that we see with every other civilization and people. It's above history, beyond nature. And they just have to convey this point to Pharaoh. So good luck with that. But as the story unfolds, that's exactly what they do. And although it takes a couple of parshas to accomplish, stay tuned, and a couple of plagues tend to be precise as it happens. I hope I'm not ruining the ending for you, but eventually the Jews do get to go. I think that's why they call it Exodus. This part of the saga emphasizes that it took both Moshe and Aharon to make it happen, to bring this message to both Pharaoh as well as to the Jewish people. It seems that each was the primary spokesman to a different audience, right? When talking to Bnei Yisrael, Aaron was the main messenger. When, spe- when the message was being delivered to Pharaoh, Moses was the mouthpiece. It seems maybe the opposite, right? Moshe protests to God. Uh, he's Aral he has, He's of uncircumcised lips, and he has trouble speaking, so he can't be the one to uh, speak to the king of Egypt. God says, don't worry. Aaron, your brother, will be your interpreter. So we don't mix up, but so we don't mix up their roles. The, ro- the verses that we mentioned before say Aaron Umosha when it's time to talk to the Jews, and who Moshe of Aaron when it's time to talk to Pharaoh. So we know who's the main spokesman. Now, why? Why was it so? What was the logic behind each appointment of, to each spokesmanship, each position of responsibility? Rav Aaron Soloveitchik explains that, of course, we always need to have both sets of tools in our toolbox. My words, not his. We need to have chesed and emes, kindness and truth, or tzedek and shalom, righteousness and peace, both. Neither side of the balance is optional, neither can be cast aside. However, there is a time and a place for everything. And perhaps, he suggests, the roles of Aaron and Moshe are here to teach us that when we're speaking internally amongst ourselves, our leading inclination should be Aaron's approach. Chesed, shalom. We should mainly be focused on kindness and peace, which also implies that when speaking klape chutz to the prime minister, the king, the governor, the senator, whoever it is, Emes and Tzedek have to be the leading qualities. Remember the verse in Tehillim that while kindness and truth met, uh, righteousness and peace kissed. What do we say? How do we say it? Chesed ve'emes nivgashu, tzedek v'shalom nashaku. Meeting is one thing. Kissing is another. It's an alliance. It's a connection, a bond. A key to understanding might lie in the next verse that that psalm says, truth will sprout from the ground and righteousness will look down from heaven. Er emes me eretz titzmach v'tzedek mishamayim nishkav. Medrash Rabban Beresha says that when God was about to create human beings, there was a protest. From who? Truth. Emes protested. It said, hey, you're going to create human beings? Truth said, I don't see this ending well. They're going to create a lot of fake news. You mark my words. <clears throat> As we know, God went ahead and did it anyway. Here we are. And the Medrash says God threw truth to the ground. Interesting, threw truth to the ground. But remember, ground is where things grow. Cultivating truth in others is a process, like growing crops or a tree. You have to plant, you have to tend, you have to be patient. Truth takes time to grow and ripen. That's why there's no mitzvah to rebuke a person who won't listen or won't change their ways. You have to be patient and grow and develop. But righteousness, tzedek, will look down from above, from shamayim. Emes is talking about spreading a true idea to others. Tzedek refers to my own behavior. For me, I can't say, well, it takes time. I have to develop and grow. I have to do my very best right now to demonstrate and to model behavior of righteousness. Chesed and Emes can meet. They can intersect and interact, but not with those who don't believe in them. For there to be a real connection, an alliance, a neshika, a kiss, That's for tzedek and shalom, righteousness and peace. They have to validate each other, believe in each other, and form a real connection. We're in a period of time right now, which for reasons that are hard to understand, Jews feel very free and safe and comfortable criticizing each other in public. They think that the more people hear it, the better. You can thank the internet 
for this wonder of modern living also. Anybody with a keyboard and a Wi-Fi connection is already a pundit, if not an expert. So many of us go about telling what we think is wrong uh, about other Jews. In other words, what each one is, uh, is, uh, is doing uh, that they shouldn't be doing, or the opposite. This has to do with Jews in Canada, America, Jews in Israel, the government in and out of Israel, and everything else you can imagine, with probably a few things that we haven't thought of. We lead with truth, because isn't it important to tell the truth about others, especially if more people hear it, then all the better. The whole Aaron and Moshe relationship suggests that real wisdom, not to mention really getting things done, like getting the Jewish people out of Egypt, for example, takes both the outstanding qualities of Moshe and the outstanding qualities of Aaron applied at precisely the appropriate times. It makes sense in the model of Moshe as the spokesman to Pharaoh that our public face ought to be tzedek and emes. We ought to be known for our righteousness and our uncompromising passion for truth. And no less strongly than our dealings with one another ought to be of chesed and shalom, kindness and making peace amongst ourselves. Again, not to compromise truth, but to lead with kindness towards our brothers and sisters. Last year, a book came out in English by a leading Israeli government official, a former uh, career military commander, who talked about his close, friendly relations with the longtime head of the PLO, whose name I don't even want to say on Shabbos. They would meet together, they would joke around, they would tell stories about their families, share a meal, and of course, somewhere in there, they would talk about how to manage the conflict between Israelis and Palestinians, which is great. It's good to know that somewhere, adversaries, even adversaries, can behave a little bit like human beings. But in the chapter where he talked about meeting with one of Israel's great rabbinic thinkers and teachers, this uh, Israeli uh, politician, uh, military commander, said they couldn't find words in common. They had nothing to speak about. That seems sad. How can two countrymen, two Israelis, two Jews, be unable to speak, to find any common language? Remember how we got into this whole mess. About Joseph's brothers, it says, Velo yachlu dabro shalom. They could not even speak peaceably to him. And they wound up hatching a plot to kill their own brother. And they finally sold him into slavery. And we've had no end of suffering ever since. The Rosh Hashiv of Ner Israel here in Toronto once told my father-in-law, Oliver Shalom, Koydem kol, you have to be beseder with the Ebishter. First of all, you have to align yourself with God. Maybe he was paraphrasing Shlomo HaMelech, King Solomon in Mishlei, in Proverbs, where it says, when a man's ways are pleasing to God, God makes even his enemies come to peace with him. Somewhere, someone, it may have been the Israeli rocker Aviv Geffen, phrased it in the negative, which is also instructive. He said, I think it was him, Someone who cannot make peace with his brothers will not be able to make peace with his enemies. It's an interesting case. Happened last summer. He's sort of a pop figure of the left in Israel. But he gave a concert in one of the settlements and he sa said that he sees those Israelis as brothers. And that was more important than political differences. That's a major point to focus on. We're very preoccupied with peace with others. But amongst ourselves, we continuously point out the faults and shortcomings. The world doesn't seem to be much better for it. So maybe it's time to try another approach to deal with one another with kindness and peace and let righteousness and justice grow from that fertile soil. May we see it continue to grow and flourish among nations, among the Jewish people, and perhaps most of all within ourselves. Shabbat Shalom.